Well, thank you for coming. It's a delight and an honor to moderate the Bioeconomy Blueprint panel discussion. I have the pleasure today of speaking with four panelists who will describe the impact of this new federal commitment to biological research in the four big areas of health, energy, food, and environment. You all should have panelist bio sheets, so I won't take time to do a full introduction. But we have here today Per Pinstripe Anderson from Cornell University, an expert on food and agriculture, Joel Cherry from Amaris Biotechnologies, a thought leader in new energy solutions, Rena Singh from the Biotechnology Industry Association, who has led in understanding environmental issues and approaches to confronting them, and finally Keith Yamamoto from the University of California, San Francisco, an expert you are an expert, an expert in novel <laughs> approaches to health care and also an author of the National Research Council's Biology in the 21st Century Report, which was instrumental in framing the scientific community's thinking about the grandest challenges facing the nation and the world, really, and how to enlist biology partnered with other scientific and engineering disciplines to solve them. I was delighted when I read the, bio, the Bioeconomy Blueprint the other day. The way I see it, it sends a clear signal to basic and applied science researchers, private industry, and investment communities that the Obama administration is committed to investing in biological research with the overarching goal of strengthening America's bioeconomy. I especially like the Blueprint's recognition that solving problems in health, energy, food, and the environment require, requires integration across scientific disciplines, biologists collaborating with physicists, chemists, mathematicians, and engineers. The report also highlights that we must work to solve these four problems jointly, not one by one. We cannot figure out how to feed a hungry world if we do not simultaneously act as respons responsible stewards of the environment. Likewise, we cannot find biological solutions to the energy crisis if we do not simultaneously understand where we will grow the food and how we will, we will deliver it around the world. And I like that the blueprint addresses another crucial aspect of cross-disciplinarity, that neither the government nor the private sector can solve these problems alone. We need to do a better job of coordinating policy levers, including finding the right level of regulation and business ambitions to achieve the huge potential of the bioeconomy. That part's important. So I'm hoping that our panelists can describe and imagine some of the most promising avenues of research and how they can bring their respective fields to fruition and in so doing contribute fundamentally not just to knowledge but to the health of the nation's overall economy. Now unlike the panelists, I'm not an expert in any of the four areas that lie at the heart of the bioeconomy blueprint. As you heard, I'm a microbiologist. I work on bacteria. But since I'm obviously well known as being a shameless huckster for microbiology <laughs> and how it holds the answers to many, if not most, of our problems, I want to use my remaining few minutes to convince you that microbes are the heart of the bioeconomy, the microscopic but powerful Federal Reserve Board of the bioeconomy. <laughs> The conventional understanding of microbes as causative agents of diseases has led us to consider them our deadly enemies. For sure, microbes can kill us, and the possibility of epidemic disease is real and increasingly alarming as we witness the rise of antibiotic-resistant microbes, the lack of new antibiotic therapies to combat them, and the dramatic increase in Earth's human population. Much less appreciated are the central roles that microbes play in shaping the environment and maintaining plant, animal, and human health. Microbes have spent billions of years adapting to, inhabiting, exploiting, and taming every niche on Earth. Microbiologists know this, and we are now mining microbes for new genes, new molecules, new biochemical pathways that hold great promise for medical, agricultural, industrial, and technological applications. Already, microbes serve as workhorses for the production of industrial catalysts and pharmaceuticals, ranging from insulin to antibiotics to vaccines to probiotics. Microbes are the most promising source for the next generation of environmentally and politically neutral fuels. They provide the part sets for the, for the field of synthetic biology, a new field of science devoted to developing robust industrial scale biological machines and processes. Microbes keep all higher organisms alive. They help humans digest food, they provide our vitamins, they aid in the development of our blood vessels, and they educate our immune systems. Learning more about the marvelous roles that microbes play in our health will enable us to harness their powers to give us longer and healthier lives. 
Microbes are required partners for all plant growth, making microbes an untapped resource for adapting crops to grow and produce maximally in more places and with fewer inputs, such as nitrogen-containing fertilizers, which are financially and environmentally costly. And because microbes are critical drivers of Earth's biogeochemical cycles, they are important players in climate change, both as sentinels and potentially as mitigators. Indeed, microbes have the ability to consume, sequester, and degrade greenhouse pollutants. Finally, I should note that although microbial diversity surpasses everything else on the planet, scientists have studied deeply only a handful of microbial species. We know there are millions more. That means there are thousands of millions of microbial genes that produce molecules, ingenious pathways, biological machines, and structures that can be discovered and exploited for medical, industrial, and agricultural purposes. In terms of the economy, just think about it. Microbes are our planet's only limitless renewable resource, and this cachet remains virtually untapped. So here's my plan for the bioeconomy. We need to conquer the bad microbes, enslave the useful microbes, and reward the good microbes that devote their tiny lives to keeping us alive. We need to look to the accumulated smarts of eons of evolution, expertly preserved inside of microbes for timely approaches and solutions to problems of global significance. So enough about me and my microbes. I'm now going to invite each of the panelists to take three or four minutes to describe how they see their work fitting into the bioeconomy and how they see the bioeconomy contributing to solutions to grand challenges. And then we're going to have a lively discussion. And I just want to remind you that we will save time for questions from the audience at the end. So one other reminder that none of us wrote or were involved in the blueprint itself. We're not the right people to ask specific questions about the blueprint. We're here to lay out grand possibilities for solving giant challenges. So first, Joel Cherry. I hope you can all hear me. I'm going to remain seated. I don't have the stature to stand, I guess. So thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to, to President Obama and the secretaries for coming in and supporting, I think, this very important uh, blueprint for the bioeconomy. Um, I'm here representing Amaris, uh, an Emeryville, California company that is a living, breathing example of the new bioeconomy. While our commercial focus is to develop no compromise renewable fuels and chemicals, the first technical success came in 2005 through a public-private partnership between our founders, who came from UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley and the Gates Foundation, to, pr to produce uh, an anti-malarial therapeutic called artemisinin. Malaria is a preventative, curable disease that claims the lives of more than a million people of year, a, a year, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. Artemisinin, artemisinin combination therapies, or ACTs, are the best treatment currently available. However, manufacture of artemisinin by extraction from wormwood is both expensive and, evolve and has a volatile supply chain uh, that induces large shifts in the, in the cost to the sick, many of which uh, are not able to afford it. This is where synthetic biology can help. Deliver the same product through stable industrial production process at lower cost. Successfully completed in 2008, Amaris entered into an agreement to license our artemisinic acid producing yeast strains to Sanofi Aventis on a royalty free basis for the pr purpose of producing this anti malarial drug. Amaris remains committed to expand the reach of ACTs through its nonprofit, Zagaya. Although Amaris won't see any profit from its work on artemisinin, the funding received allowed us to build an innovative technology platform for the creation of new microorganisms capable of producing virtually any molecule found in nature or not in nature. Amaris is one of the best examples of American innovation in the nascent bioeconomy. Today, with over 350 employees, Amaris is applying the very same industrial synthetic biology that can save malaria patients to replacing petroleum sourced products used in specialty chemical and transportation fuel markets. Quite simply, we engineer microorganisms, primarily yeast, and use them as living factories in established fermentation protocols to convert plant source sugars into potentially thousands of molecules. Our platform is general and can be applied to the development of microorganisms for the production 
of a wide variety of fuels and chemicals. With a passion born of our heritage developing an accessible and affordable malaria treatment, Amherst is using the same scientific platform to create sustainable products that will reduce our society's dependence on petroleum. Driven not only by market opportunity, but by the principles inherent in our DNA, Amherst DNA. Amherst develops products under the highest standards of responsibility and sustainability in order to preserve the health of our planet and its people. Today, Amherst is in commercial production of two products with many more to come. The first is a renewable diesel product that has been approved by the EPA. It blends up to 35% with traditional diesel. It has a significantly smaller carbon footprint and virtually no particulate, NOx, or sulfur, differentiating it from other biodiesels. Already over 150 city buses are running in a fleet in Brazil, and hopefully we'll get them into a fleet in the US soon. Now using the same molecule, the same technology, and adding a, sing a single chemical step, Amherst also produces a product called squalane that is one of the best emollients in cosmetic ingredients and also can be used as an adjuvant uh, for vaccine development. Other producers make squalane from uh, deep water sharks by extracting their livers and dumping them back into the water, which, is not, uh, which may be uh, renewable but not very sustainable. Uh, and, uh, or from olive oil through extraction process, which is also a very energy intensive and uh, water consumptive process. Replacing these technologies with our yeast-based fermentation process reduces environmental impact, improves sustainability, and produces a higher quality end product. We applaud the bioeconomy blueprint and hope it effectively accel accelerates development and commercial commercialization of products like these. Amherst's experience in bringing these products to market shows that bridging the gap between the lab and the marketplace requires a highly skilled workforce, access to capital, clear regulatory environment, and an educated society necessary for acceptance. The benefits of executing the bioeconomy bio blueprint are great. Stronger economy, a cleaner environment, geographical distribution of production, and associated rural development, which is what Secretary Vilsack said, and a future filled with innovative solutions. The possibilities are endless. From biolo biological productions of fuels and chemicals to close, closed loop recycling and reuse, new materials with improved performance, medicinal foods, direct conversion of heat or light to chemicals and fuels, designer environmental remediation microbes, for pure water and soils, and biological computers that diagnose diseases. All these things are possible. In closing, the bioeconomy bio requires us to rethink what's, what's possible by applying inspired science to solve our biggest problems. From fuels to chemicals and beyond, what we're doing is offering no compromise products with a new technology at the same cost. That's what the bioeconomy is all about. So let me echo Joel's thanks uh, to the, uh, the administration, the secretaries who are here, uh, all of you for attending uh, this uh, important announcement of this blueprint, and of course, Mary Maxson's fantastic efforts in, in the conceptualizing and putting the whole thing together and making it work. I think midwifing was the term that was used. Um, uh, it's uh, tremendously important. Uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes just telling you how uh, the strategic objectives of the bioeconomy blueprint uh, bring together key elements. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, are, not, are not amplifiers. So I'll, tr I'll, try to, I'll try to speak up. Um, so I want to tell you about how the strategic objectives of the Bioeconomy Blueprint are bringing together key elements of a spectacular opportunity in health and health care. And that opportunity is the realization that it is time not only to promote the advances across multiple scientific disciplines, but to begin to merge them and integrate them in new ways. Um, across all these disciplines, across engineering, mathematics, areas that were not traditionally felt to be in the biomedical research um, uh, arena. 
and link, them to get, link all of those advances together with clinical observations, clinical data from real patients. So the outcome of this 21st century synthesis, if you will, is outlined in a recent report from the National Academy of Sciences that I was privileged to be a part of. And that outcome is called precision medicine, the capacity to diagnose and treat diseases increasingly tailored to individual patients rather than the decisions based on statistical risk factors across large populations. A, bit, a revolutionary change in the way that medicine is realized in terms of what happens with the actual patient. So this report calls for the creation of a dynamic, continuously updated, interactive repository or information commons that could generate a massive knowledge network linking layers of data in a manner that is reminiscent in some ways to Google Maps that we're all familiar with. And in doing so, in creating those linkages and realizing the correlations and connections um, uh, would reveal new patterns, new relationships that advance our understanding of the mechanisms of disease and directly inform the treatment and care of patients. So this new synthesis then would link technologies, technologists, I should say, engineers, uh, computer scientists, uh, laboratory uh, investigators and, tra and their trainees, um, social and behavioral researchers, and patients, importantly patients, and would create a continuum that would extend from discovery researchers, curiosity uh, driven in their laboratories, to actual patients, and by linking all of that information, change the nature of health and health care. It would bring together new alliances among academia, industry, we just heard about some with, uh, with AMRES, uh, foundations, entrepreneurs, um, and government funding and regulatory agencies. So what would it take? Achieving precision medicine, what's needed, and what difference would it make? Well, I'd say, I'll just mention two things that are needed. Um, uh, it would demand a diverse, highly skilled workforce a different, a, a, with a sort of a different flavor than what we have now of highly specialized training in fields that are, uh, that are mainly kept separate from each other. Not much communication between them and not much of a linkage of, of the information that emerges from one uh, disciplinary area to another. And it's going to re require new investments or redistributed investments. Um, investments on the public side from the government investments in the private side from foundations, from com companies and industries that would drive increased discovery, uh, innovation, uh, construction of this knowledge network that I, that I referred to, uh, entrepreneurialism and business formation to uh, lead to the development and, and delivery of these discoveries into real application. What would happen if we were able to, to do this? It would lead to the creation of new jobs in computing, technology, engineering, and research, and the, and the, and the um, applications that would lead to new product uh, formation. It would lead to better health with increased productivity on the part of our citizens. And, and finally, it would reduce health care costs uh, by deploying only the tests and drugs and treatment plans that are needed for it to be effective for each patient. So in terms of the economy, it would grow it by establishing new things to do, and it would al also improve the economy by reducing costs that, are, uh, that everyone is aware are really been running out of control. So. Thank you. Okay. Let me... Uh, Let me begin by thanking Bernie for making me like microbes a lot more than I did last time they attacked me. <laughs> so now I know who to call next time they get after, they come after me. Uh, Secretary uh, Vilsack uh, already stressed the importance of a strong bioeconomy in order to feed future generations. Uh, so let me make a few additional comments along the lines of food, agriculture, and the role of um, of the bioeconomy of biological research 
and its application. First of all, it's critically important that we not only feed future generations, but we do it in such a way that we maintain and hopefully strengthen our productive capacity. And that means sustainable management of the resources that we have. And we should also feed future generations in such a way that they become more healthy. There is a very close relationship between the food system, what we do in the food system, whether it's research or application, and what happens to human health. More than half of all of the health problems that we are confronted with originated in the food system. And this interaction is very poorly researched. We need a lot more research on that, on that interface. But before I go any further in terms of what I think we need to do for the future, let's just take a quick trip back uh, to the past and see, did biological research really have an impact in the past, or are we just kind of um, dreaming and postulating? Um, I would argue that biological research and its innovative um, application uh, to food and agriculture, both in the United States and elsewhere in the world, are responsible for this very plentiful food supply and the relative low food prices that we, can, that we have today. Yes, I know food prices are a little higher than they were 10 years ago, but guess what? If biological science hadn't been applied the way it was, we would have been in a totally different place. And we can, we can translate that to the future. If we stop doing research, so if we slow down our biological research, we're going to regret it 20 years from now. Maybe I won't 20 years from now, but my children and grandchildren certainly would. We would be in a very different place. If we look at the impact of the Green Revolution, which was brought about by biological research and application of the research results, what we find is that millions of Asians were saved from starvation and death. Uh, the Green Revolution, the biological research contributed to yearly increases, not only in Asia and Latin America, but also in the United States, and they provided the foundation for future, for future food, food security. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, is the job hasn't been done. The job isn't done yet. We still have many millions of people who suffer from hunger, from malnutrition, and from illnesses that could be cured uh, with um, a better, uh, a better um, uh, let's say, more and better research and application of the research results. Uh, the key word really is sustainable intensification. We need to produce more food, and as I mentioned before, we need it to do it in such a way that it results in sustainable management of the resources that we have and hopefully improved health. Climate change uh, calls for new scientific endeavors to counter negative effects and to uh, enhance positive ones, the effects on food system and related matters. Uh, we really do need a, a, a strong global bioeconomy. Today we're talking about bioeconomy for the United States, but we should really be talking about collaboration with the rest of the world. We need a strong global bioeconomy in order to make sure that everybody gets enough to eat and very few, few people get too much. And that relates right back to the health question. We got a tremendous problem with overweight obesity, not just, and chronic diseases, not just in this country, but uh, in many other places in the world. We must invest in bio, in the bioeconomy with foresight, because there's a long lead time between research and its application. And therefore, we must have the foresight. What we don't do today, as I mentioned, our grandchildren are going to pay for 20, 30, 40 years from now. Uh, that's the kind, of, the kind of lead time we should be, we should be thinking of. Uh, as the blueprint correctly points out, the collaboration and coordination should not be limited to the federal agencies. It should include U.S. universities. Hopefully Cornell University will be part of that. Uh, it should include research centers. It should include the private sector, where a tremendous amount of bio, um, biological research is undertaken, and it should include civil society. We should really be talking about, and this is what the blueprint is proposing, talking about a true collaborative, collaborative arrangement. Uh, we need to apply appropriate scientific methods, and we must not be held hostage by anti-science sentiments and advocacy groups. We must use science 
where it is most appropriately used to solve the problems that societies are faced with. And my last point is that we need to strengthen the foundation for science by allocating funds to basic frontier science, as well as the translational applied kind of science. We must focus on problem solving and we must strengthen the bioeconomy through collaborations across disciplines. We must get rid of the disciplinary silos and we're still operating in silos and there are a number of ways that we can try to get rid of those. Um, we must collaborate across sectors and areas of concern, including the four we're talking about this afternoon, namely environment, energy, health, and food. They all interlink. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you. Um, I would first like to thank uh, Dr. Mary Maxim for her hard work and very appreciative for what we're holding in our hand today. And also, of course, our secretaries for endorsing our uh, United States uh, uh, blueprint. So uh, I would also like to thank the Office of Science, Technology uh, and Policy for, uh, for the uh, opportunity to participate in the, in the rollout of this very significant national bioeconomy blueprint. Uh, Bio represents more than 1,100 biotechnology companies in, in the United States and 33 nations that use and develop biotechnology products. Biotech innovation started with healthcare applications, then moved to agricultural applications, and now to industrial and environmental applications. We call industrial and environmental biotech the third wave in biotech innovation. What is industrial biotech? Industrial biotechnology is the application of life sciences to conventional manufacturing and synthetic processes. It uses wild type or genetically enhanced microbes which result in novel processes and products. It lowers the production costs, reduces or prevents pollution, and enhances resource conservation. The bio, uh, bioeconomy blueprint will help unleash biotechnology to bring us cleaner, safer, and healthier technology for biofuels, renewable chemicals, and bio-based products. Think about when in the 1800s, uh, petroleum replaced whale oil. We are going through a similar time of change now. Our bio members have a vision for a future where biorefineries dot the landscape uh, in, instead of petroleum refineries. We see hundreds of new biorefineries or biomanufacturing facilities uh, being built to process renewable feedstocks uh, and into biofuels, chemicals, and bioplastics and other value-add products. This vision includes cleaner air and water, sustainable farming practices, and less reliance on fossil fuels. It, uh, it, it uh, suggests a replacement of toxic chemicals with safer bioproducts. These biorefineries will create hundreds of thousands of new jobs and require thousands of highly skilled workers in all regions of the country. Manufacturing applications will come out of biotech innovation we, can, we cannot even imagine uh, today that will transform how we make and use energy. One day, we may even use uh, biological computers and biological fuel cells that produce clean fuel for our cars or our homes where all we have to do is add sugar and water to generate power. We will see the advancement of biological pollution cleanup technologies beyond, beyond bioremediation, um, like an organism that will eat carbon dioxide from power plants and use it to make clean burning hydrogen or natural gas. Uh, or possible compostable, compostable bioplastics. This is not about picking winners and losers. We, with biotechnology, everyone wins. These will be permanent solutions that will create not just jobs, but careers. Industrial biotechnology is a leading force for innovation in the United States. And innovation is the key to economic health and prosperity. The bioeconomy blueprint will help biotech produce real results and is a game-changing uh, results that we're looking for.
and looking forward to. Thank you. I want to thank Rina, especially for getting us into this um, mode of thinking big. And remember, we're scientists, so we're not just fantasizing up here. We're actually thinking and trying to tell you the future that we envision. And it's the future in our lifetimes or pretty close after that. And so these are the things that we think about. These are the reasons that we do science. We all think our science contributes to this better health, better life for Americans, and also a very different economy for America. And so I'm just going to try to um, ask a few questions that I was thinking about um, from my colleagues and then um, see where it goes. And so I'm going to start with Joel, with a hard one. So I want you to try to think as we, as we dream these big dreams, what do you see the biggest challenges to actually having this bioeconomy happen and happen fast? I think like any new technology, there's, a, there's this valley of death. It's easy to come up with things in the lab and to generate new ideas. Uh, and the difficulty is in transitioning that to the marketplace, having sufficient capital, having the ability uh, on the regulatory side to have influence, and uh, eventually uh, using some sort of product bridge to get you to where you want to go. From Amherst's perspective, we want to be in the fuels business eventually. The bridge is uh, specialty chemical products that we can make money at before we can make money at, at, a, at a product like that. So um, I think from an execution standpoint, that's the most difficult piece. Anybody want to pipe in? Okay, good. Uh, good. Uh, Rena, I'm going to go to you. So you told us we're going to add sugar and water and heat our houses and run our cars. And so that would be... That would be amazing, and, and, and it, that's far out in the future. So tell us more specifically, in the near future, what are the breakthroughs that you, in the field of you know, the environment and industry, what, are, what is it that you really see on our horizons that we can count on? Okay, um, so today, government policies and um, uh, private sectors have uh, contributed to, uh, from research and development. They have contributed innovations uh, which have resulted in some very good technologies that are at the fo forefront of not only have they been, been commercial but are on their way to getting commercialized. So let me just walk you through a couple of those. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll have to also say something about universities. Uh, one of the uh, daunting tasks we, d we today have with universities is we do need to uh, recognize that there's a lot of good research that happens there, but it, it's a little bit challenging to get them out into the man marketing, manufacturing, commercial arena. So we need to do a little bit harder work there, some very good research going on. And so uh, we have, at this point, uh, with a lot of uh, advanced biofuel technologies, we've got new molecules on the horizon. We've got bioisobutanol, biobutanol, um, they can be produced from uh, cheap, sustainable sugars. And these cheap, sustainable sugars come from cellulosics or cellulose that are, are not uh, uh, food-based. Uh, so basically, we've got enzymatic technologies available to us that can convert a lot of these cellulose to these cheap uh, sugar sources. And so some of the other molecules that are out there today are uh, bioisoprene, okay, which is basically uh, petrochemically isoprene uh, that now we know how to make uh, biologically, and we call it bioisoprene, which can be polymerized to polyisoprene, which gets into rubbers, and guess where that goes? Into your tires. So we are actually able to be self be self sufficient, sustainably produce these and from homegrown technology in the United States. Other uh, chemicals that are out there, other chemical, renewable chemicals and plastics are, are also forming platforms, some examples. So Keith, I think I'll accuse you of the same thing, which is for this transformation in healthcare, which would be fantastic for each American to get his or her personalized absolutely specific healthcare, but can you point to like how we step our way there to a specific example to how these different scientists and engineers are going to collaborate, you know, and then tell us what the real social and economic impacts would be. 
come we don't get to ask you questions about your microbes? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let me give you an example from my own institution. Uh, uh, Dr. Shubal Roy at UCSF is a bioengineer, and he is leading a team, coordinating a team of clinicians uh, and scientists and engineers to develop um, an artificial kidney, uh, an implantable uh, organ uh, that filters toxins from the blood, as kidneys need to do, but also does other important physiological kidney functions. Um, uh, this has actually long been a goal, but he is uh, far enough along, he and his team are far enough along in this development, working together in remarkable ways, uh, that this device has been uh, recently selected as a pilot uh, accelerated review project by the FDA. Uh, Vicki and a couple of other friends are here from the FDA. Um, um, and uh, is expected to dramatically uh, uh, improve the quality of life and the survival for patients with end-stage renal disease. Now let me, just, in terms of thinking about quality of life and, and economic impact, tell you a little bit about end-stage renal disease or chronic kidney failure, it's also called. This, this is a disease that affects 570,000 people in the United States for whom treatment is primarily covered by Medicare. So this is 1% of the Medicare population. But this disease is consuming roughly 7%, about $40 billion um, of the uh, Medicare budget. The only effective therapy for this disease right now um, is a kidney transplant. So of that 570,000 people afflicted with these diseases, uh, 100,000 are waiting. They're on a list hoping for the availability of a, a kidney transplant. Uh, last year, about less than 17,000 uh, kidney transplants took place. So the rest are waiting. Of the 570,000, what's their alternative right now? Uh, dialysis, in-clinic dialysis. Enormously expensive procedure. Uh, Five-year life expectancy, about 35%. Um, and so for those who do live, quality of life is severely compromised, and, and only 35% live beyond that five years. So uh, here's a collaboration of, of engineers, scientists, clinicians that have really come together to focus their expertise um, on, on creating this device. It's moving through the regulatory process quickly, um, and we're hoping that it can have the kind of impact that it really appears to be having right now. Okay, so I'll stick with this business because a big point of the blueprint, right, is that we, and Keith, you're already talking about it, is that these scientists have to work across disciplines, which has not been traditionally the way science has been carved out. So, Perrin, like when you think in the food and agricultural sector, you know, how do you even see that, that the government, the agencies, that the scientists, that we can foster these kinds of interdisciplinary um, associations and collaborations? Let me talk about research at the universities, and academia, if you like. And the question is really incentives. The incentive to me as a researcher is to dig deeper into a very narrow area so I can publish referee journal articles in those journals that are very discipline specific. Uh, and if I want a promotion, if I want a salary increase, I will stick within my silo. Um, the way to, to, to change that, it seems to me, is to provide incentives of various kinds to university researchers to spread out, not to become generalists. We still have to have an in-depth understanding in one uh, discipline, in one area, but enough appreciation of the other areas so we can work in teams. I'm not suggesting we generate interdisciplinary individuals at the universities, but interdisciplinary teams um, where the individual team member has the incentive to work on, problem, on a problem-focused uh, research project. Um, I'm not sure where to, where to start with this. It's kind of the egg and the chicken in a way, because we can start with the researchers and hope that that uh, is translated into training, or we can start with training in the hope that somehow we will change the researchers. At Cornell, we're doing both. Uh, we're trying very hard uh, to have all of our PhD students in the departments that I'm responsible, that I'm uh, associated with, um, have multidisciplinary uh, PhD committees. 
Uh, we have funds from the National Science Foundation to do uh, interdisciplinary training for PhD students. So we do a number of things like that, but if you compare that to what's going on in the rest of the university, it's still a very, very small part. So the answer, it seems to me, Barney, is really the right kind of incentives, and it's not just money, it's not just promotion, it is also where can you get uh, your things published, where, where, which conferences can you go to where you can be applauded for doing or saying all the right things uh, that cut across these various disciplines. So those will be some of the things. And, and coming back, I think, to, to what you were, you were saying, Rena, the, the problem focus is extremely important. And I think that's why translational research is now kind of becoming a widespread concept, certainly in the health uh, and, and nutrition area. Um, where the idea is that even if you do very basic frontier research, there should be a way of somehow having that filtering all the way through the system so they will have an impact on either on people or on societies in general. Thank you, Fair. And so I'm going to follow up on that, that if, if these we scientists who sit in these institutions could actually do this and get our work out there, so then the problem is the way we train people. They've been trained the way we are. And so, Keith, you alluded in your opening comments to a new kind of workforce. So, you know, what is it that we have to change in the way that we train people so that this workforce actually appears in time to make this bioeconomy flourish? Um, very important question. So let me, let me uh, try three quick, uh, uh, quick changes that I think uh, could have a real impact. Um, one is that I think that it's, it would be, this is really the time in such a dynamic endeavor for us in academia to step back and reassess, re-examine what it is that we're delivering to our students in terms of what they leave our institutions, uh, in this case with a PhD degree. So this is a graduate education. And I'll bet you if we do that, um, we would uh, put a sharper definition on the elements of training, the basic concepts of training, um, uh, that would change the way that we, we do our teaching, the way that the research projects are envisioned and executed in a way that would uh, result in the right kind of expertise, and I'll address that in, in a moment in my second point, the right kind of expertise. But maybe more importantly for this point, uh, would, would deliver that training more rapidly. And why is that important? Um, we're, we're, we're now at a stage where the, the data show us an alarming trend, and that is that the age of investigators in achieving their, in, in, in getting their first independent position has risen to 38 years for PhDs, and getting their first independent uh, research grant, 42 years. And that's, that's, those are really scary numbers. And it says that we are burning up critical years of people's bold creativity um, by keeping them in training. And I think if we re-examine that, that could change a lot. Uh, point two is to, and, and this is really relevant to what Per, per said, and, and this is to create some integrated training programs that bring together uh, disciplines that, such as engineering, computation, with the more traditional biological foci. Not with the goal of making Renaissance uh, uh, men and women who are experts across uh, all of this, but rather those that are, have, have uh, the kind of literacy that are needed across disciplines that is needed in order to allow them to, to carry out their specialized uh, interests um, in, in ways that can really move them forward uh, effectively. So integrated training programs that really incorporate um, these different disciplines. And then, and then um, uh, I think the other place where we're falling short is, is uh, really presenting to, to our students uh, what the range of opportunities, career opportunities now exist. Uh, when I was training, and I realized that was, you know, back when wheels and fire were just coming into, <laughs> but when I was training, it was a linear pipeline. You know, when you started in graduate school, you knew that you were going to come out as an assistant professor. And now there's a wonderful range of careers that really need to be filled by people with this kind of training if our whole endeavor is to move forward. So this is not, this, I'm not, this call for um, uh, introducing the diversity of career opportunities is not merely a favor for the students, but I think is a necessity if our, if our whole endeavor is to move forward, to have people in communication, policy, law, education, and so forth. Um, uh, 
train people in these areas. So that's the second point. And then finally, let me pull back from graduate school and let's all realize that it's not just PhDs that are needed to be able to carry out this bioeconomy and that we need to be pu pulling all the way back to what, the, what happens in science education at earlier stages and not, f and not shooting only at the PhD as the endpoint for the kind of product uh, that the academia needs to be turning out and looking for uh, training programs at the undergraduate level, at the community college level, that really bring to the, f bring to the fore the kind of attention to the, the range of opportunities. And these will be the people that will be able to carry out the range of technical and scientific um, opportunities and challenges that the bioeconomy presents. So I have um, about 20 more questions, but don't worry, because I'm not going to ask any of them. Um, and I want to thank, thank the um, panel for giving a few just sort of highlights. And I just want to remind everyone in the audience that the things that the panelists are talking about, they're in much more depth, they're in the report, like this idea of a new workforce training regime, the idea of the, the products that are here now, these private pub public partnerships that have really um, been successful and that, that are also imagined and then also how food affects health, affects the environment. And so I encourage you, of course, to read it and hopefully we give you a flavor of the kinds of big challenges that are there and then also the marching towards solutions. And so um, I want to give every, whoever wants to ask these four some questions, there's a microphone right there. We have a few minutes left if you want to quiz them. They're here. Bonnie, too. Yeah, no, 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 no. What? Two. Two, I go up there. <laughs> uh, first of all, I uh, commend the report um, in its comprehensiveness and uh, particularly addressing graduate education. Uh, the graduate students are the ones that work at the frontiers of technology, and they have no idea what their future careers are. They think they're going to become an assistant professor. They don't, just as Professor Yamamoto said. So in terms of uh, training these uh, graduate students, the institution culture has to change to say that if you do not become an assistant professor, it's not a failure. Uh, if you become an entrepreneur, it's a success. So what kinds of incentives that uh, funding agencies can provide to change the culture that will facilitate this, uh, these new PhDs into new careers? Thank you. So I, it's a very, really important question is changing incentives and rewards and, and um, having academics realize that there's more out there than just creating clones of ourselves. And, 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 and I would love to see the federal programs such as the, the training grants that the NIH offers uh, create a mandate that this kind of bread, exposing students to the breadth of opportunities out there is a part of the training regime uh, that, that uh, is, is included in any training grant. Um, and I think doing that will, uh, is really a standard bearer that says the federal government and the institutions that are awarded these grants regard that, regard that whole range of career opportunities as being valid and important. Just, just to follow up on that, uh, Amherst is hosting two students from Delft University as interns over the summer, and part of their education, their PhD programs, is a required internship outside of their home country. And I think the U.S. adopting something like that would have great value, and we're looking forward to getting some free hands. So. Yeah. That's good. Educating the public as to the benefits that this, this technology provides is extremely important, and that needs to happen really quickly. We have an entrepreneurship program at Cornell that is very well attended by students. The students are very, very interested they, uh, they, uh, to attend the courses and the activities. So I think, I think we are trying very much to instill entrepreneurship into our students, whether they're undergraduates or graduates. And I think the culture really is changing. We all get, we can, we're scientists, we get the numbers. You know, they all have to wait for us to die to get our jobs, right? And so I think that that awareness slowly is seeping into academics and this idea that, that littering this country with scientific thinkers in all walks of life is fabulous for the country. And there's more than one way to be a scientist. And so I think what you're imagining is totally happening at the university level. One more question. I love to always disobey the government. <laughs> Come on, you guys, help me. <laughs> no 
anybody else want to clear it off? Uh, yeah, you're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>